pleasant Sunday morning to you. Pastor Richard Orrell, Battlefield Assembly of God, the town of Battlefield, Missouri, just outside Springfield. We're so happy that you could take a little of your time this morning and share uh, Sunday morning church with us. And uh, you might still have time to make it on over to the live service. We are meeting at 1030 on Sunday mornings these days. And of course, social distancing and we have uh, seats arranged so that we can do that. And lots of hand sanitizer and we suggest hand washing. Masks are fine. Um, gloves, we, we do have some with masks and gloves and that's fine. Um, we, we just want you to be safe. But we also want you to come and be a part of the church. So um, get get out and get with it and come on over. We just love to see you. And um, oh, let's pray as we begin the service. Thank you, Father, for this privilege that is ours to be together. And uh, we pray now that your blessing and and uh, the touch of God would be upon all of us. May we worship you as you deserve to be worshipped with. Uh, great enthusiasm and in spirit and in truth. We give you praise for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful song. Betty Jean Robinson wrote it. He is Jehovah. Perhaps you know it. You can sing along. He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty.
All hail King Jesus. <clears throat> well, these are strange days we live in, are they not? You might almost believe, if, if you listen to some of the, um, oh, I don't know, when I was a kid I heard them called calamity hollerers, uh, naysayers, people who see the glass half empty rather than half full. If you listen much to them, the church as we know it is a lost cause. They point to empty buildings, and certainly empty they were for quite some time. And uh, the fact that many programs uh, still are curtailed. And uh, so due to the fact that restrictions and limitations have been placed on us, many do seem willing to just write her off as an idea whose time has come and gone. Mm. Me, not so much, and I rather suspect because you're listening to me this morning, you probably feel something like I do. Um, so do we, the Church of the Living God, do we buy into such unbiblical nonsense? Nah, uh, we, we just don't. I, I know I personally do not buy into the Church being dead or dying or something like that. And from your performance as the church. I see the church as alive and well, functioning properly, doing its job. It's a little more behind the scenes than it has been, and our gatherings, uh, when we do get together, are not uh, perhaps as huge as they once were. But uh, the church is still there. And honestly, the reason that we can see it Instead of seeing the glass half empty, we see it half full. And, and the reason we're that way is because we're putting our faith in something with a lot more credibility than any news agency. Uh, the, the, the network news, uh, none of them bear the credibility in our eyes or in our mind or certainly not in our heart that this precious book does, the Bible. I mean, this is the, the Word of God. Wouldn't you rather listen to what it has to say than somebody who has formulated an opinion, perhaps nice people, but, but isn't it possible that they missed it about the church and that what this book has to say is, is much more credible? I think so. Our hope is built on the Word of God. The psalm says, Our, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And of course, here's where we get that. Now, <clears throat> if, if I really want to know then how the church will fare in whatever challenging days may yet lie ahead, days of disease, disaster, disillusionment, and for some, days of despair, if I want to know how the church will will fare in that, then I really need to go to the Bible and let it speak to the very depth of my soul. Now, <clears throat> as the Bible sees it, the church is certain things, and there's no way that in one message anyone could plumb the depths of such a subject, but I'd sure like to take a good start at it this morning as we consider so exactly what is the church. Well, <clears throat> remember over in uh, Matthew, is chapter 16, and it begins uh, up in verse 13. I know you're very familiar with this. I hope you have your Bible before you and can follow along. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Praise God for his holy word. May it just speak to our hearts today. So, <clears throat> I, I read that, and there's excitement that begins to just well up within me as I realize this is, this is commentary from the very Son of God who was shortly to give his life a ransom for us, for many, uh, those who will believe. And, and so what he has to say bears huge weight. And what he is saying is power and authority. The spoken word from the church has great power and authority. On this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. That's how the Bible sees you, Church of the Living God. You say, well, doesn't that mean when we all get together and, and worship in, in chorus and, and people play instruments and, and there's a sound system? I, I don't really see that here. Instead, it's who you are, it's who we are collectively, scattered through our neighborhoods and through our community, believers all trusting God and expecting and anticipating mighty things. Now, <clears throat> over in Colossians chapter 1, I wanted to uh, uh, have you take a peek here. It's, uh, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. It says, now, now this is about the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that out in the uh, 13th verse. It's talking about the Son of God that he loves. And so it says in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. There's who is the Lord of the church, creator God. He is before all things, says verse 17, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. That's who the Bible sees you being. That's who the Bible sees you functioning as in your community, in your home. The body of Christ. How amazing. And then also, uh, that same concept shows up in verse 24, for the sake of his body, which is the church. It's you, the body of Christ. So how amazing that uh, the creator God in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he is identified as the logos, the outward expression of the Father, the very word of God, capital W-O-R-D, the word of God. If you want to know anything about God, you must find it out through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you want to know how God feels about kids, look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, he says. And swept aside tradition, and peanut butter and jelly and all, whatever kids had all over them, Suddenly he's got it on him because he took them up in his arms and he blessed them. That's how he feels about kids. You want to know how he feels about the disadvantaged and the diseased among us? Watch as he walks along the dusty, filthy streets of little communities in Galilee and he touches lepers crying unclean, unclean, and everyone else scattered like a covey of quail when they came along, but Jesus just touched them and healed them and made them well. That's how he feels about those who are socially disadvantaged, those who are medically disadvantaged, those who are impoverished in some way. He's with you and he cares about you. That's who is Lord and head of the church. It's his body. That's why it works is because his nature and his power and his will and his feelings about things is working out through us. 
in our communities. Creator God, the church is the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 and 24, the church is the body of Christ. If you're with someone, why don't you turn to them and, and say, if you're a believer, you're part of the body of Christ. They might not yet know it, but they will as soon as you tell them. If you're a believer, you have become a part of the body of Christ. What an amazing place to live. The Creator God now lives in His church. The church is God's temple. In two passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, both of those passages clearly indicate that God lives within the church and sees us as His temple. That's who you are. It doesn't matter whether there's one of you or two of you or 2,000 of you. It doesn't matter how many there are. If you're a believer and you have invited the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit has brought Father, Son, and Himself, the Holy Spirit, into your life. And God lives within you in a very real sense of the word. You are the temple of God. And that's why it is so vital that we take care of ourselves, that we take care of our witness, our testimony, our walk with God, our daily devotions, our prayer life, our character, all of that. Because He lives within us. The church is God's temple. Physical location is recommended but only really for our sakes when you get right down to it. I understand Hebrews 10, 25 suggests that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more so as you see the day approaching. So we are there. We're at the end of time. I am convinced of it anyway. Humor me. I'm an old guy. But I believe we're getting close to the end of time. Don't know when it is. I just know that my spirit is crying for heaven, and I see it in so many of you. And so, we, as, as, as God lives within us, we are drawn to be together with people of like precious faith. We want to encourage one another. We want to lift each other up. And yes, it's true what the scripture says, iron sharpeneth iron. We're a good influence on each other. What a wonderful place to come and be a part of an organism, a living, breathing organism, the body of Christ, and to look around and realize, I get to spend eternity with the likes of these, these who give and love and care and pray and are there when friends are going through stuff. And so, yeah, we need to be in a location with all other believers that we know and are attracted together with. We need to be there as much as possible. But that doesn't then negate the fact that we are the church. Wherever we may be, one or a dozen, we're with him and he is within us. The Bible view of the church is way different than the milk toast and pablum version that I hear talked about. Churches ducking for cover and running and hiding, not us. The Bible sees us in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 4 and 10. The Bible sees us as an army terrible with banners, something to be frightened of, Mr. Devil. If the devil happened to be listening this morning, I've got news for you. You come around here, Pastor and God's people, you're going to be the one in trouble because God has identified us as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. And in, remember the first scripture we read, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we're actually hell gate bashers. There is no, no uh, uh, fence big enough that hell can create to keep you away from your loved ones when it comes time to go to them and talk to them about their soul and talk to them about Jesus and share Christ with them. You've been displaying a Christly attitude and you've been displaying what is about to live for God for many, many years and there comes that moment when it's time finally to talk about the elephant in the room and you get to tell them Jesus loves you just like you are. All you have to do is come. And, of course, the enemy doesn't want that to happen. They have all kinds of stuff that, that he throws up as gates to impede your progress into their life to share Christ with them. But I have this promise, we have this promise, that because you're the church, then there are no gates of hell that can survive against your onslaught. We're soul rescuers. 
That's who we are. That's what we are. I'm reminded of a time in the Gospels when really it was Jesus' idea for them to go to the other side. And they headed out, and surely as God, he knew, understood that there was bad weather ahead. Uh, as someone who had lived in the Galilee, surely he understood that the lake was so capricious and things could happen so quickly, but he bade them go to the other side. There was business afoot, and so they start out, and late they toil at the oars, and finally it looks like they're going down, and he is asleep in the boat. But just understand this, it's Creator God, it's Savior, it's Messiah, it's Master, it's Lord of the storm who is asleep on that pillow in the back of the boat. And so finally in desperation they awaken him and he steps up and does exactly what we need done right now as a nation and in the lives of many individual believers and in churches across our land. We need the master of the storm to step up and level his finger, clear his mighty throat, and speak, peace be still, into the storm. That's what he did. That's all he did. And suddenly there was a great calm as Jesus took over. Would you let Jesus take over as you face storm after storm? The waves are crashing and smashing your little vessel. It feels like your life is going down perhaps for the third time. But the Bible doesn't see it that way. The Bible sees you as powerful. The Bible sees you as secure. The Bible sees you as saved. The Bible sees you as the one that the devil should be running from. You're an army terrible with banners, church of the living God. One at a time or dozens. Hallelujah. Would you just go ahead and be who God has called you to be? And don't let the devil spook you not even with COVID-19 or any of the stuff that's going on. The streets, uh, yeah, there's riots and looting and pillaging and plundering and terrible things going on. But we're the terrible ones, an army terrible with banners. Get out there and be the church of the living God. Let the love of God sweep you into the life of somebody who's desperate for the love of God. Let's pray. Father, help us to get what you're saying to us. Help us to re-engineer how we see ourselves. Help us to see ourselves as the church that is in fact triumphant. The church that is incredibly powerful. The church that is incredibly effective in witness because the Lord of creation is Lord of the church. Thank you for Jesus, mighty God of heaven. Thank you that you sent your Son for the likes of us. We give you praise and glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. And I speak to you, dear friend, in Jesus' name.